to scene one of Macbeth. Um, the building background prior to uh, Act Two is kind of interesting because uh, it might sound like a, a previous a movie from 2005, V for Vendetta. If some of you have seen it, um, that is not necessarily a period piece. However, it does reference the gunpowder plot. Um, and in reading this, some of the you know the being religious based, trying to bring back Catholicism as the main thing. So I mean, all of that whole story that I went into great detail on about Henry VIII and and the the, the upheaval of religion between him and then his daughter Mary and then everything else. Um, you can see that people took uh, some legitimate actions to try to uh, um, you know to fix it and rectify it. Um, and so V for Vendetta is um, you know premised on on that. In uh, 1605, uh, was it 1605? Um, there is. I think I put a clip, or I think I edited down the movie into several clips and put that on my Moodle page. Um, so if you wanted to take some time and look through that, um, I just. I think I just cut up the stuff relevant to the gunpowder plot. So when they were reenacting it, um, I think I put that in there and, and that type of thing. So. Um, uh, it's interesting because it's not necess It's not like Independence Day in England, um, like our July Fourth. But yet they they have fireworks and they celebrate it, um, you know, pretty uh, pretty religiously every year um, with a big fireworks display over the Thames, over the river. So it's um it's of interest. So um, good. So that was of note, and I wanted uh, to make sure you got uh, you read that and and. We talked about it briefly. Um, the literary element motif is uh, highlighted on 337. Um, you know, a significant phrase, description, or image that is repeated throughout a literary work. I've mentioned this already a ton, and we've only, we're only one act into this. Uh, you know, the motifs of supernaturals and the repetition of three and the witches and what they represent. Um, we haven't had blood too much yet, um, but that will change uh, where blood is, is present a lot, either realistically or, or, or figu figuratively. Um, and so we'll see that um, how it plays out. Uh, the term equivocation, uh, deceptive testimony, um, that'll come about when we see the porter who has only one scene and one monologue, and that's it. Um, and, but that's really the, the main, uh, the, the only uh, example of deceptive testimony that we really focus on. Um, there's a couple other elements here and there, but that's, that's the first one uh, of substance. Um, so act two, scene one. We are now inside the castle of Inverness. We concluded Act One by saying, uh, "Let's see, we're getting yeah, Act Two, Scene One." Uh, we concluded Act One with uh, you know Macbeth kind of wussing out a little bit, and then Lady Macbeth got him going and said, "Here's the plan. Here's what we're gonna do." And he says, "I'm resolved. Let's do this. I will go. False face must hide what false heart doth know." Was his last uh, exit line, and so he is going to. Uh, they, they have the party. Everything transpires at the bank with the festivities. Everything has transpired between when we stopped and where we're starting now. And now it's nighttime, and a lot of people are in bed. Um, notice we see Banquo here talking to Fleance. Uh, Fleance is his son. Um, it's very brief, and then Fleance goes, and Macbeth and Banquo finally have an opportunity to talk. Because remember, they said at a later time, we'll talk about the prophecies and such. And um, so look at the discussion back and forth. Are they being honest? To each other, try to answer that question as as we uh, as we go through this. Um, on the right page at 3:39, this is Macbeth's monologue. So those of you who chose Macbeth, uh, this is his soliloquy rather. Um, he's getting ready to go and do the deed. Um, you know, he's not really wavering as much as he was before, but yet he's not sprinting to go and do it with, with all of this, you know, jubilation and such. Um, and so he's seeing this, you know, metaphoric, imaginary dagger leading him towards the way. Um, so it's a very, uh, very, very famous monologue. Um, so kind of work yourself through that and feel free to use footnotes and such. And these scenes aren't very long. They're just two pages long. Um, so don't uh, get discouraged and uh, stop paying attention. So uh, act two, scene one. <laughs> scene one. Uh, Banquo and Flans start off. Um, you can see how, uh, you know, nighttime, they're in the castle courtyard, the set up there. Late at night, the torch, you know, what time is it? Um, you know, uh, they hear the clock, it rings, that type of thing. Um, uh, where's it? Banquo, look at his line in the purple. He says, here, take my sword. There's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. So in essence, it's a way of saying that there aren't any stars tonight. So there must be something that's happening. That some, you know, there, something's happening tonight. It's kind of like if uh, there's an old saying with sailors. 
Um, if there was a, I can't remember exactly, if there was like a red sky, then there was something that happened last night. Or, yeah, there's something superstitious like that. Um, and so here it's one of these little things. He goes, ah, it's really dark out, especially if there's no moon or no stars. Oh, I wonder what's, why things are being hidden, why the heavens are keeping somebody from seeing something. You know, that just, just a, a little line that just kind of adds a little bit of foreshadowing and mood to, uh, to everything. Um, and he said, you know, go to bed, go to bed. And so he leaves. Um, and that's really, I think we see Fleance one other time, and it's really for about as long. Um, but yet he's significant. Okay? Why is Fleance significant? He's, he's his son. Remember the prophecy was uh, to Banquo was, you will get kings, you will have kings. Now, that makes us think, well, it, they didn't specifically say Fleance, but yet we can kind of infer that hey, that's, that's him because it could be some other children, maybe some children Banquo hasn't had yet, some offspring. Okay, maybe it's a lineage. Maybe it skips Fleance's generation. Who knows? They, they don't say exactly when it is and they don't name it, so it's kind of tricky. But yet we should realize uh, Fleance's heirs are pretty important. Okay, and so that, uh, Banquo's uh, heirs are important and Fleance is one of those heirs. Um, and so that's why he comes on and goes away. So you go, oh, he does have a kid. That kid's probably important. And we will see that play out in the next couple scenes. Um, so Banquo and Macbeth talk, um, you know, uh, Banquo's line, uh, you know, the king's abed. You know, everything was great today. Everything was fine. Um, Banquo goes, all's well. I dreamed last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. Macbeth's response, I think not of them. Is he lying here? Of course he's lying. Every thought since the moment that that happens has been this. All of their actions, the things he's getting ready to do on the next page is in result of what the witch sisters have said. But for him to come out and go, yeah, man, I've been thinking about that all night, all day. That's unbelievable. And I'm going to be king. That's crazy. He doesn't want to let on that, you know, he's thinking about it. So he's trying to false face must hide, right? And so that's what he's playing on air. But, I mean, he's just flat out lying to Banco here. I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, so when we can find some time together that fits our schedule, we need to sit down and talk about this. The same thing you said earlier. Doesn't it seem like now would be a great time? I know it's late at night and all, but for, for Macbeth, he's a little busy because he's getting ready to go and do some, do some stuff, some stabbing. Okay? Um, and so his, his, his schedule is a little bit full. Um, so they leave. Macbeth is left alone on stage. We can imagine the, the setting, the mood, the darkness, the no stars, the impending doom that's going to happen. He doesn't desire going to kill Duncan, but he's, this is what's going to happen now. And I don't think blood freaks him out and murder freaks him out because, well, excuse me, not murder, but uh, just death and taking a life because we saw, actually we heard from the captain his, his actions on the field. And so... He's one to take a life without much problem. However, the motivation to do so is completely different here. Okay? I don't think he thrills at doing it, but he knows this is my job and my duty. My wife came up with a plan, and now I have to do this in order for me to become king. But think, guys, is he going to be king? No. When Duncan dies, it's going to be Malcolm. That's what that big announcement was in that previous scene. Okay? So um, there's got to be something that... That's gonna have, maybe he's thinking, I'll just take out one now, and then we'll deal with the other later. I, I don't know. Um, but this is the speech on 339, the, uh, what is this, number four monologue, I think. Does that sound right, those of you that have number four? Um, this is the one that I had to memorize in high school, my senior year. And I totally put it off and forgot about it. And uh, being a last name A, I have to go first a lot. You guys kind of know how that is. You know, in the front, and then those in the back go last. Um, but they, lucky for me, they took volunteers for about half the period. And so I was able to memorize. Within 25 minutes, I got probably 15 to 16 lines. And that was the day that I realized, OK, I can kind of do this. I kind of under, I understood it. I understood what he was saying. I was able to, I was good at memorizing. I did theater stuff. But, um, but I was able to just kind of focus 
And as people were up there talking, I was able to kind of run through what I knew and then you know, add on a couple here and there. Um, so I'm not proud of that because I don't think my grade was very good. But I was pretty impressed that I was able to throw down so much um, with so little time. Um, so please learn from my mistake and, and don't do what I did. Um, so actually learn it for yours. Um, you know, is this a dagger which I see before me, this imaginary dagger? The handle towards my hand, come, let me clutch thee, let me grab thee. And reach, I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling at the sight, or art thou but a dagger in my Are you fake? A false creation from the heap of your brain. It, 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 you're, you're still the same as this which now I draw. So you can imagine him pulling out his own sword and dagger. Now, is he going to use his sword and dagger? Is that part of the plan? No, they want to use the chamberlains, the guard stuff. But he's saying that this dagger that's leading him it, in all, you know, spirit, memory, and you know, all these thoughts, imagination, it seems as real as this which now I draw, as this which I have in my hands. Um, you know, he goes on to all of this description and metaphors and, and allusions to, uh, you know, different gods and pale Hecates. Uh, Hecate, we'll talk about her later. Um, she's in charge of the witches, so all this witchcraft stuff and the darkness that he has to uh, do. Um, the last couple lines there at the bottom, uh, Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabouts. So you can imagine him creeping across the stage very slowly. And all of you at some point in your life, I'm sure, have um, had to sneak up and down the stairs or down the hallway for whatever reason, and you hit that creaky stair, or there's that spot in the hallway that you know is creaky, so you kind of lunge over it a little bit and land on your toes like a cat, you know, and all that stuff. Um, it's similar here. He's not thinking about creaky stones. But yeah, he doesn't want to make any noise where people might hear that, hey, somebody's walking around. Then later on, somebody died. You know, he killed him. You know, the, Dun Duncan's dead. And they're like, hey, somebody was walking around last night. And they can kind of figure it out. Okay, not necessarily it's Macbeth, but we don't want to leave any clues. So he's talking about, you know, being very quiet. Um, the last couple lines are really nice because the bell rings. And that's a clue from Lady Macbeth that, uh, okay, it's clear now. Those guys are drunk and they're passed out, so it's clear for you to go. Okay, so a little ding, 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 ding. Kind of like a little kitty bell or a dinner bell. Not like a ding, dong, you know, nothing big because that would be stupid because it would wake people up. Um, but uh, he goes, I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Macbeth exits. Now, these are a couple of those lines I tell you every once in a while as these scenes end with a real kind of poetic, you know, license of words. You know, false face must hide what false heart doth know, that type of thing. And here's one, that hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. So that's the starting gun going off. And Duncan, you're going to die here in a minute. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell, and that bell signals it. And so he goes off to do the murder. Um, and, that, um, and that's, we don't, like I said, we don't see a lot of the stuff happen on stage. And it's implied that that's going on. Scene two uh, with Lady Macbeth, um, she's done her bell ringing and she's back in the room. And while she's in the room, this is going on, Macbeth is doing his deed uh, in, the, in the king's chambers. Okay, and so uh, as she goes on here, we see her, it's not so much a soliloquy, well, she is the only one on stage, so it is technically a soliloquy, but you can see it's not many lines. But we see what's going on in her mind. Does she still think that he's, uh, he being Macbeth is able to go and do what he needs to do? Or um, you know, were there some mistakes? It's taking too long. What's that noise? You know, kind of the paranoid thing you, you would probably have if you were you know, planning a, a murder and it was you know, being conducted at that particular moment. Um, because you know, if things go wrong, it's not like my bad slap on the wrist. You know, it's treason. Traitors, you die. And so there's a lot riding on it. Even though it's a great plan, it still needs to be followed through. And so we see her um, kind of thinking about it and fretting and things. Um, Macbeth comes in, and I want you to notice Macbeth. Does he walk in all proud? Does he walk in kind of whimpering and crying? Is it something in between? Um, how does she respond to the way he responds? It's kind of strange. And this is really the presence of blood for the first time in this play. Um, that, and we physically see the blood. A lot of times it's mental blood, um, the imagination. But here it's, it's physical blood. And uh, look at how blood is almost its own character in this particular scene. 
Um, and then the Lady Macbeth and Macbeth scene um, upon killing Duncan. So, pretty good. <laughs>
Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the blood on the, sleep, the sleepy grooms. Macbeth didn't finish what he was supposed to do. He did the murder, the, the daggers, you know, stab and so on. And then they woke up and that freaked him out and so he came back. But he brought the murder weapons with him. You're supposed to leave those. You were supposed to take that blood and smear those guys. You didn't do it. And he's too freaked out. He can't do it. I'll go no more. I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on again. I dare not. Oh, infirm of purpose. Good golly, man. What's going on with you? Man up again. Okay? So again, if she wasn't here, he would be lost. Okay? It's important that we establish these roles um, in this relationship because things are going to change next act. Okay, and things are going to go all over the place. And, and if we don't know where they were at the beginning and what happened to them, ultimately where they end up, it doesn't make much sense. And so we have to see this uh, progression. Um, so give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. Okay, so if they're asleep or dead, you, you can't tell. They're, they're, just, they're not really dead. They're just sleeping. Just walk in and do what you're supposed to do. Done. Okay, that part of her plan that definitely needs to happen. Um, and so go gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. And then somebody knocks. Okay, not on their door, but on the, the gate, the, the, the entrance to their castle or their abode there. Um, who's knocking? What is it with me when every noise appalls? Oh, I'm scared by every little noise. What's going on with me? And so he's really kind of a nervous basket case. Okay, he's kind of lost it. So he hasn't handled himself uh, too gloriously or too kingly, um, as we probably would think. Um, so Lady Macbeth takes, had taken the knives when Macbeth hears a knocking, and she comes back in, and now her hands. Um, you know, my hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. So my hands are the same as your color, but I'm, I'm not as upset as this as you are. Because this blood is, there's so much blood. Look at what he says at the very top. He goes, with all great, or will all great, Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine. So he's thinking that my, there's so much blood on my hand that if I put it in the water, the water is going to turn what color? Red. There's so much blood here that it won't wash my hands clean and take away all the evidence. In fact, there's so much blood that it'll turn the seas red. Okay. And so, again, blood, I've, I've told you a lot, um, it's going to be playing out more and more. And this is, you know, uh, just his mindset going into this. And we see him kind of losing it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so she comes in, she goes, you know, a little water clears us of this deed. You know, just wash your hands, everything's fine. Um, and then Macbeth, at the end, he says, to know my deed, to her best not know myself. Um, I, if I am aware of my crime, it would be best for me to remain in this day because she tells him, quick, quick, somebody's here. We must get out of these clothes. Not only may they have blood on them, but they're wearing their clothes from the night before. Everybody else has gone to bed. Everybody else is sleeping. Everybody else is in their nightgown or whatever pajamas that they wear. And so somebody's knocking. So we're going to have to go out and, and see who it is. If they find the body right now, we're going to have to rush out. And it's going to look weird if we're still dressed in our clothes from the night before. And he's still in his days. He's like, leave me alone, leave me alone. And she's again trying to, you know, just she's probably smacking him on stage to get him, you know, to, to see reason. Um, and then this last line again, another one of those poetic lines. Uh, the knocking's been going on. You know, wake Duncan with thy knocking. I would thou couldst. So you can keep knocking all you want. You're not going to be able to wake him. Okay, so he's kind of losing it. Now, the next time we see him, he's kind of calmed down a little bit, and we'll see this uh, in scene three. Three is inside. This is the porter, his only scene. He's kind of like the, the watchman to some degree. He's extremely hungover from the banquet. Everybody's been partying. Everything was, woo, great. And somebody's knocking, and he wakes up, and he's still hungover. And so he's just kind of walking. This is kind of a, it's not that it's hilarious to us, but this was a humor piece um, in, the, in this otherwise tragedy. Um, it's kind of a nice little uh, a break for the audience so they can kind of come down off of that excitement. Um, so when we find the body here, because we're going to be introduced to Macduff, who is a very important character, and Macduff is there to have an appointment with the king. The king told me to call on him. Well, here's where we're going to find the body. So it happened pretty quickly, 
And look at the reaction from all the people. Look at Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's reaction. Do they play their cards right? Are they acting appropriately? Um, Macduff and all the other things, how are they acting? What about Malcolm and Donalbane, the two children of, of uh, Duncan? How are they behaving? And so on. Um, so pay attention to those. Um, this is the, one of the lengthy ones in the play, about eight minutes or so. Um, so scene three. <laughs> Okay, I'm just starting off with the porter. I'm not going to take too much time there, but did you notice how it looks different? It's written in, a, in prose, like just normal sentences and stuff, not so, uh, you know, lined and everything. Um, and I think this is the only time that this shows up in the play. Um, it's just a little comic relief, a little bit different, you know. You can imagine him entering from one side of the stage and exiting on the extreme other. Just shuffling his feet slowly, knock, knock, I'm coming, I'm coming. You've seen that in movies before, and, and during each knock, he can go, oh, oh, I'm so hungover, oh, what are you doing? Oh, gee, you want to come in that bad? What's going on? And then they knock, I'm coming, jeez, come on. You know, so it's just something silly to kind of spice it up a little bit or give you a break from the, from the um, drama. Um, 344, we have McDuff walk in, um, and as I said in, the, in setting up the scene, <clears throat> As I said, setting up, he is being, uh, he's there to have a meeting with, uh, with the king. And, um, and so he goes. He goes to find him, and he leaves. Uh, Macbeth and Macduff have a good morrow. Oh, is the king stirring? Not yet. Oh, he did command me to call upon him. Okay, well, go. He's there. And so while he's there, you know, we have Lennox, another thane. Uh, we have Macbeth sitting around talking and that type of thing until Macduff enters on 345 around line 60, uh, he comes in, whore, 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 tongue, not heart, cannot conceive nor name thee. I, I can't speak of the horrors that I've just seen. You know, this is horrible. Um, what's the matter, Macbeth and Lennox? You know, so in the audience, we'd be just staring at Macbeth, trying to see if he's really, you know, like, oh, my, what happened? I have no idea. Da, da, you know, or would he be, you know, would he be acting different? Because the last time we saw Macbeth, he was not very, uh, he wasn't very, um, put together. He wasn't very collected. Okay. Um, and so Macduff says that he was murdered, you know, so everybody find him. What, do you mean his majesty? Go and look in the chamber and destroy your sight with a new Gorgon. And there's the illusions. Uh, there are tons of mythical illusions um, that Shakespeare utilizes in his writing that we don't necessarily know. So you have to look at the footnote, which is a mythological monster whose gaze turned an onlooker to stone. We know that name as being what? Medusa. She was a Gorgon. And so you go in there, and the, the, horror, the horror of the situation will turn you to stone. Um, and so ring the alarm bell, murder, murder, treason. Because it's not just the murder of somebody, but a treason against your king, you know, against your country. Um, the next page, so everybody, I mean, commotions come on, Banquo enters in. Uh, Lady Macbeth is there. Whoa, alas, what in our house? No, no. Banquo, too cruel anywhere, dear Duff, I prithee. Contradict thyself and say it's not. Please tell me you're joking. Please contradict what you just said and say it isn't so. Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. For from this instant, there's nothing serious in mortality. So Macbeth, what a great line to say. You know, if I had died an hour ago, fine. But I don't know about living now with this, our noble king gone. Do you see the act that's being played here? Obviously, he has to say the right things. Um, and in fact, he starts to say a little too much here at the bottom. Um, Donald Bain and Malcolm enter. What's amiss? What's going on? I hear all the commotion. What's going on? You know, what is amiss? You are and do not know it. The spring, the head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father's murdered. Well, by, by whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, but had done it. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood, and so were their daggers, which unwiped we found upon their pillows. They stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. So did her uh, plan work? <coughs> yes. They found them dazed, staggering, covered in blood, and they hadn't washed themselves yet. And so they found it. It was perfect. <coughs> Look at what Macbeth says, because things start to unravel slightly, slightly here. Oh, yet I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. 
Wherefore did you so? What? Why did you do that? So Macbeth, hearing that you know that these murderers, Macbeth went in and killed them, which is what you know that was part of the plan. Okay, he went in and silenced them. But he's questioned about it. Now Macduff is not saying, Macbeth, why did you do that? You must be guilty of murder and treason, murder, murder. No, he's not saying that. Just why did you do that? Because don't you think they probably wanted to talk to them and find out why they did what they did? Because surely two guys, you know, one guy could easily be infiltrated and murdered, but both of them were secret agents. Maybe they were working for somebody. Maybe they were killing him for someone, and we could have talked to them and questioned them, but no, you had to go murder them. That was all kind of, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Macbeth, who can be wise and amazed? temperate and furious who can be loyal and neutral in a moment no man the expedition of my violent love outrun the pause and reason I was so traumatized and so angry that I had to, I just had to kill them and and take my revenge out on them so who can be temperate while they're furious who no man can I did what any man I did what anything here would do he doesn't shut up he keeps going on. He gives four or five more lines on the next page. Look at Lady Macbeth. She faints. Help me hence. Ho. Oh. Why does she faint there? Ah, very good. To draw attention, to shut him up. Okay? Because he's just talking and talking and talking. That, if you guys are ever interrogated by the cops, they want you to talk, don't they? hopefully not from personal experience, but from, you know, you're watching shows and movies, they want you to talk. They want you to go on and on and on with your stories because eventually they're going to catch you up on some, especially if you're lying, they're going to ca catch you. That's what their logic is. And so they want you to talk. And so the best thing you do is just sit there and be quiet. And so he's not doing that. Who could refrain that had a heart to love and in that heart courage to make love known? She faints. Look at Macduff. The only line he said on the previous page before Macbeth started talking was, why'd you do that? I paraphrase. Why'd you do that? She faints. Oh, look to the woman. Did the distraction work? Yes. He didn't go right back at Macbeth. And he wasn't there to attack Macbeth. He's just questioning, well, why'd you do that? Why, that doesn't make much sense. Why'd you do that? Oh, look after the lady. Look to the lady. Uh, Malcolm and Donalbane have a little aside. Why do we hold our tongues that most may claim this argument for ours? You know, what should be spoken here? You know, let's away our tears are not yet brewed. They're still kind of in shock. They're not bawling. They're not, you know, they're, they're not uh, acting the way that they think that they should be acting. How come the Thanes and this woman's fainting? All these people have greater reactions to our father being murdered than what we do. Our tears are not yet brewed. Let's, let's go away a little bit and talk. And so they, they kind of excuse themselves in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but even Banquo, you know, look to the lady. So Banquo and Macduff, okay, don't you think Banquo might be a little suspicious? If not right now, do you think maybe in a little bit, once it can process it? I would think so. I think you guys would be suspicious of him, um, and so on. Um, the last couple lines of Banquo, uh, he kind of says, let's go talk about this and see what happens next, because we don't have a king. We need to figure something out. We need a leader. So, in the great hand of God I stand, and thence against the undivulged pretense I fight of treasonous malice. And then they're saying, let's go and talk about this. Uh, Macduff says, so do I. Let's go and, and confer. Um, hey, let's go meet in the hall, Macbeth. The next page, we see Malcolm and Donalbane are pretty much left alone here on stage. Well, they are left alone because everybody left. Um, Malcolm says, let's, uh, let's go away. Okay, what will you do? Let's not consort with them. So let's not go to the meeting with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office. And so they're afraid that they're going to be charged with this murder because who has the most to gain? Not Macbeth. Who's going to be the heir? The Prince of Cumberland. Malcolm. And so he goes, let's, uh, you know, we can't go there and come up with fake tears. They're sad their dad died, but they're in shock. They don't know how to act or behave. So he goes, I'm going to go to England. And Donald Bain goes, well, I'll go to Ireland. Our separate fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. Because their dad was killed by somebody close. Somebody who loved their dad in theory. 
So these men who are smiling are the men that have the daggers to do the, you know, somebody in the house did the murder. Okay, somebody probably put those men up to doing it, even though the, the murderers were killed um, with the daggers. Um, and so they decide we're going to split up because we're safer. Okay, because if we're in the same place together, it's a lot easier for somebody to find us and get, kill us. Because if they went after daddy, they're probably going to come after us. Can anybody think of a movie where the premise was to take two kids and separate them for their protection? Star Wars. Star Wars. Parent Trap. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, Star Wars and Parent Trap in the same sentence I've never heard before and never, hopefully, will I hear again. Uh, but Star Wars, okay, they take Luke and Leia as children and they separate them. One goes to Alderaan, one goes to Tatooine. Vader thinks that they're dead. He thought that they died in childbirth when Padme died and all of that. But they separate them for the greater good of the children that should one of them ever be found, the other one is there. Okay? Um, and so it's a, very, it's a very smart move on their part, um, you know, Donald Blade and Malcolm, to separate and they, for this uh, perceived fear. Because in essence, you know, Macbeth, he probably, the next obstacle that he must knock out or knock down is, is Malcolm. Um, and so we have Malcolm, who should be the next king, and Donald Bain, Bain fleeing the country. Well, then who's going to be king? Hmm, we're going to find out here in a little bit. Uh, scene four, the castle of Inverness. Um, time has gone by a little bit. Uh, this last scene just deals with um, two individuals, the old man and Ross, who is the Thane, who shows up from time to time at kind of just uh, key moments and has phrases. Um, they have a discussion here about some supernatural things that have happened throughout the night. And usually when things happen bad in these stories, you know, um, there are other omens and sights that they witnessed or nightmares. Um, see if you can pick out. I believe there are three um, that are pretty prominent that seems a little bit strange uh, for uh, what should really be happening. And then ultimately Macduff talks to Ross uh, to wrap it up. And we get to see kind of Macduff, how he's dealing with this. Um, and we find out uh, what happens with Macbeth. <laughs> Scene four, act two, scene four. Um, the old man and Ross are discussing about uh, some of that supernatural things that happened throughout the night. Uh, the first of which is in Ross's line, um, you know, the purple text, you know, by the clock tis day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Kind of a neat poetic way of saying the sun, the traveling lamp. And yet it's still dark as if it's night, but yet it's, it's day. So that seems kind of weird. Okay, and so all of these things that happen, these omens, make people think that something bad, obviously something happened bad with the king, um, but you know, maybe there's uh, something more, um, some subtext to it. Um, the second one you might have overlooked a little bit, but uh, the old man goes, ah, yes, that is unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday, last, a falcon, towering in her pride of place, was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. Falcons should not be killed by... Um, uh, by an owl. Okay, so things are kind of strange here. But then lastly, Ross goes, and Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift, the minions of the race, you know, the, the footnote, the best of the breed, the best of the best, they turned wild in nature, broke their stalls, flung out, contending against obedience as they would make war with mankind. So they wouldn't listen to any man. Ah, tis said they eat each other. They did so to the amazement of mine eyes that looked upon it. So the horses turned wild and started eating each other. Okay, so all three things. You know, one thing is weird, but you put all three things together, and that's just plain spooky. And the omens of things that, you know, could be bad or could be uh, possibly worse in the near future. Um, so we, we see McDuff walk out. Um, oh, McDuff and Ross talk. Ross asks, is it known who did this more than bloody deed? Well, those that Macbeth has slain. And so we see it's almost finalized where they know who did it. They know who was responsible for the murders, and it was the guards. Now, I think the mindset of us nowadays, because we, start to, we, we expect to be surprised in TV shows or movies, we want to know, well, who paid the guards? Why, are the guard, why did the guards do it? Surely, you know, both of them, you know, that if they were upset with their pay or whatever, they could have 
come about it in a different way. So it must have been, you know, funded by somebody else. Um, but we find out that the two kings' sons are stolen away and fled, which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Remember, they fled because they were worried about their lives and they were worried that people might accuse them of it. But their fleeing is actually being observed by Macduff as potentially, um, you know, that they have suspicion upon them. Because remember, who has the most to gain? It was Malcolm. Okay, and so he took off. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Ross's line 30 goes, well, then tis most like that the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. Well, then it must be known that Macbeth will probably become king. Well, it's already been established. He is already named and he's gone to Schoon to be invested, to be, have his coronation. They have a certain ceremony, you know, just like knights have ceremonies where they're knighted, you know, kneel before me, that type of thing. Um, so here he's already been gone and he's going to be a crowned king. Um, where's Duncan's body? He's off with, you know, predecessors, the other kings. So then Ross asks Macduff, and this is very important, these last couple lines. You know, are you going to go to the party? Are you going to Schoon? Are you going to the coronation? No, I'll go to Fife, which that's his title. Remember, the Thane of Fife. So he goes, I'm not going to the coronation. I'm going home. Why? Maybe he's still in shock. Does he think that Macbeth was the killer? No, oh, he said that there was these other people, and he even said the suspicion is even on Malcolm and Donalbane. But yet he's just, I'm not going to go. Something just doesn't sit right. Maybe he's tired. You know, maybe, could, could there be some jealousy, you think? Why Macbeth? Why not me? Why not Macduff? So maybe there's some petty jealousy back and forth. Ross goes, okay, well, I will hither, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Look at what Macduff says. He goes, well... May you see things well done there. Adieu, lest our old robes sit easier than our new. So you go and make sure things work out the way they're supposed to. And just in case, you know, our, you know, our old ruler, you know, um, you know, the footnote, in case the old rule suits us better than the new. So you go and just kind of help out and balance things just in case things don't go the way that we would like them to go for Scotland's sake. Okay? And so we end Act 2 with Macbeth being crowned king. And remember, a lot of action stuff happens off stage. And that's how they can get so much time and, and, and plot details in in such a short amount of time because they just, in a couple lines, they have him become king as opposed to drawn out massive scenes and chunks. Um, so from here on out, Macbeth is king. We will see an enormous change and shift in, in Macbeth. I mean, the first act, he's the warrior, okay? And Lady Macbeth kind of slaps him around a little and says, this is what we're going to do. And in the second act, he's kind of hysterical the whole time. He talks himself out of it. Okay, she, you know, uh, uh, the, excuse me, that's at the end of Act 1. Act 2, he goes and does the deed. He comes back and he's all frantic and the blood and the paranoia and people are talking. He talks himself almost into getting, not really like he was going to confess, but giving away too much. And so now we're going to see a shift uh, between the roles of Lady Macbeth and Macbeth, and how that plays out the rest of the way, okay?